Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Jared Johnson of STA Blades. Jared is a former U.S. Marine who started his knife-making business in 2020 after attending a bladesmithing class. Like so many other Marines I've spoken to on this show, his bravery has been proven twice, first in serving his country, thank you, sir, and then afterward throwing himself into small business knife-making. Now, most of Jared's STA blades are combat-oriented and derived from tra- uh, traditional patterns, translating his experience in theater into practical working tools and weapons for the battlefield. We'll meet Jared and talk all about STA blades, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share the show with a friend. And as always, if you want to help support the show, you can do so by going to Patreon. Just go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon or scan the QR code on your screen. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Jared, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's my pleasure. It's really nice to meet you. Uh, you you come highly recommended, as it were, from Matt Chase, uh, a good friend of mine and an incredible knife maker. And yeah. uh, he he said, you have to check out, knowing your taste, Bob, you have to check out STA Blades. And he was right. <laughs> no, he, he's been extremely helpful and pivotal with a lot of my... Uh, growth and just my knowledge of bladesmithing and things like that i i i I really appreciate everything he's done for me so a former u.s marine um and a new knife maker relatively new knife maker you've had your business for about three years uh tell me a little bit about your your service also thank you for your service to this country uh it's greatly appreciated tell us about your service a little bit and uh how that led into knife making yeah, I was uh, too dumb for college and too smart for jail. So uh, the Marine Corps was a was a good fit for me. Uh, I spent eight and a half years there. Uh, I got off active duty in 2002 and went into the firearms industry and worked for some uh, big companies there for quite a while. Uh, and then I entered uh, security contracting overseas. And eventually I started a, a training company doing uh, firearms training. And when I moved to Texas, as soon as I moved here, the, the pandemic hit and shut down all the business, everything. I couldn't get people to come out and train. Travel was restricted. People were scared. And I went about a year with no work. And I just got this weird bug to just try to start making knives uh, because I didn't really know what was going to happen, uh, you know, with the future of everything and, and, uh, I needed income. And so I kind of just took the last few pennies that I had and started a little collection and, and started up a forge and took some classes from Chuck Stone and just locked myself in the forge and committed to it until I felt like I had a blade that was worthy to sell. Well, uh, if if I if I may say, lots of people, myself included, uh, have been in that situation. You know, where you're out of work, not sure what you're gonna do. Prospects are weird or not there at all, and then you make a move and kind of pull yourself out. It's it's rare and courageous and interesting uh, that you chose knife making as that thing uh, to pull you out of the morass. Um, you must have had a history of making things to really feel that instinct. Uh, are you a maker already? N- no. Uh, you know, it's really weird cause I'm not very, I'm not mechanically inclined. I'm not a good, uh, you know, that, that handyman type around the house and things like that. And, uh, what, what kind of sparked it was in June of 19, no, I'm sorry, June of 20, I went up to Northern California to do some uh, firearms classes for my dad's uh, company. He has an indoor shooting range and and uh, gun store, and we were kind of doing a little behind the scenes during COVID uh, Father's Day sale at his place. 
and I'm trying to promote classes and just really trying to get up off my feet. And he has a Boy Scout table on the other side of the parking lot that people like donate like old leather holsters and belts and stuff. And then they sell them for a couple of bucks. And my sister walked over and she's like, Hey, look at this cool knife that I, I bought uh, from the Boy Scouts. And she showed it to me. And then like 35 years of just not remembering anything flashed back to me. And it was a knife that I had made in high school and I made it in like metal shop and it wasn't heat treated. It just, you know, it had handles on it and a guard and, and it was sharp, but it wasn't hardened steel. And I had completely forgotten for decades that I had made a couple of knives in high school. And I, then I got mad because my dad took a knife that his son made him because I gave it to my dad hmm. and he gave it to the boy Scouts to sell for five bucks on the <laughs> table. Right. So it was right then when I started to go, you know, I wonder if I could make like real knives because I've been around real knife makers. Like, you know, in the nineties, when I was in the Marine Corps, I became very good friends with Mick and Dwayne from Strider knives. So I I'm watching them grind in the back and they got all the respirators on and they're making all these crazy knives. Uh, you know, Greg Medford's been a friend of mine for a long time for Medford knives. Um, I was living with my buddy in, in Phoenix and Greg was our buddy and he came over one night and he had this little notebook and he's like, Hey man, I want to get your idea on some of these drawings that I'm making. Cause I think I'm going to make knives. And so he's showing us these sketches that he did. And so like, I've been around the knife industry uh, in, in some of the knife makers, but you know, I, I was never like one day I want to make a knife until you know, June of 20, I started to get the bug for it. And then, you know, I was watching Forge and Fire and, and stuff like that. And, and, uh, I was like, you know what, I, I just, I gotta try, I gotta do something. I don't know what else to do. So I did that. And I, I'm on a big ranch here in Texas that my buddy, uh, let me set up my firearms training company on. Hmm. And he said, Hey, I've got a shop. If you want to clear it out, you can move your forge in there. And so I just, scrounged up every penny I had and I just started watching YouTube and you know forging fire and making stuff and breaking stuff and not doing it right and trying to figure it out and and at that time I didn't know Matt Chase so I didn't have him to you know lean on for any advice or anything which yeah. would have been huge for me well uh so um Let's back up before we get into your process, because I want to talk about that. I want to find out about your knife usage over your life. We're like, were you a knife guy? Obviously, you were because in metal shop, you made a knife, probably right. much to the consternation of your of your shop teacher. But you made a knife. Right. Uh, no, back you... then it was fine. Back then it was it was OK. Oh, that's my, true. my daughter. My daughter was like, wait, you made a knife in school? And I'm like, yeah, we used to make knives all the time. She's like, I can't even believe this is true. <laughs> Yeah. How could she? How yeah. could she? Yeah. Um, but, uh, oh, so were you always kind of someone who loved knives? Um, and and did you use them in the Marine Corps? Obviously, I'm sure you did a, a lot, uh, probably to open up crates and stuff. But, but tell me about your knife usage and were you a collector as a kid? That kind of thing. I, um, I, I definitely, I think like any young man who's remotely allowed to go outside and play likes knives. Right. So like I had like little saber, you know, folders and, you know, Swiss army knives. I was never, I never really had fixed blades until I got like into the Marine Corps. And of course, you know, you go with the K bar to start. And, uh, and then as I kind of got a little bit more time in the Marine Corps and, and pick up some rank, you get more money. And I got, uh, introduced to Dwayne and Mick from Strider knives. And so I started buying Strider knives. So I carried, I carried Strider knives in the Marine Corps. I carried a, um, a cold steel Kukri, uh, that I, I absolutely loved. I, I, I always loved the Kukris, but that was just a, I didn't even know what the Kukri was and the, the lineage of it back then, but it was just a good tool that I could use, uh, if I needed it. Uh, and you know, I've, I've always liked knives. I've never been like a crazy collector of them. I have some nice knives, you know, but. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, what was your job in the Marine Corps? Uh, most of my time, I was I was a, a sniper, the same as, as Matt. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So interesting about the knives uh, snipers bring into the field and different situations. Uh, uh, sometimes you might want a knife that's stout enough to go through cinder block. Sometimes you need something for clearing brush. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we as a as a sniper team, there's times when you may need to make uh, what you know what's called a hide site. Um, sometimes having a little tool to to help. Uh, you know, struck, build that structure, uh, going through thick brush. You know, we did a lot of training with, with the Malaysian special forces, uh, Australian things like that. And so you're in this super, super dense jungle rainforest type stuff. And just having a, a, a K bar, you're, you're just physically not going to be able to pass through. Yeah. Malaysia they're, they're known for Malaysia and the Philippines and all of those yeah. uh, archipelagos known for their, many many different blades actually some of them are on the wall behind me i, I love yeah, Filipino I see that. Blades. um but uh, so while you were there in malaysia did you pick up any or in these different places where you go train um do you pick up weaponry from the locals or or, or blades from the locals you know i really wish that i did you know like when we go to the middle east you know you pick up some daggers and stuff like that but it's all like touristy stuff you know i didn't really right. get any hardcore stuff until uh you know many years later when i started doing security contracting um i think where it really sparked me was about four years ago i went to nepal and so i went to the kukri house and saw the kukris and got to see you know how they're made and talk to the gurkhas and stuff like that and that's where i was like man one day i really want to make a kukri like i i just you know, I carried one in the Marine Corps and now I'm seeing these, these guys making them and using them and you hear the stories, you know, and the lineage of it. And it, it kind of fascinated me. So I bought a bunch of kukris when I was there. Uh, thank you for providing me with a perfect segue. You make a kukri and I think it's yes. one of your newest models. Do you have one close at hand to show off? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, this is a, this is, yeah, I like this one. A lot. So all most of my blades are all named after a friend or a family member. So uh, this is the the JB Kukri. Let me get this right here. Um, it's about 15 inches overall length. I kind of wanted to keep the the traditional profile of the Kukri blade shape, but I really never liked the handles on a traditional Kukri. It's made out of cheap wood. Uh, it cracks. It doesn't have good retention so i wanted to put kind of a uh, you know an americanized you know fighting handle on it where you get better retention and grip for stabbing that's the thing uh I, kukris are actually really good for for thrusting and 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 that curve you might think that it puts the point in the wrong spot but actually it doesn't given how your arm swings especially if you have it slung low so in any you can thrust with a kukri just fine but you're not inspired to with the traditional handle. Uh, I see Correct. what you mean because you can slide right up. You offer this yeah. big, giant uh, guard there. Yeah, yeah, and and that's what what I'm trying to do is with the kukri. I just did a video like a week ago on my kukri, and you know one of the things that I talked about on it is when I when I grab onto this knife because of the angle of the spine up here. I'm actually in a better position where I'm pre-staged to do a good stab without my wrist being canted down like a traditional knife would need to be. A traditional knife, my my wrist would need to be oriented like this. With the kukri, I can actually be up here and have a little bit more yeah. uh, reinforcement behind the stab. Right, right. Yeah, that I mean that that runs that uh rings true with some of the Filipino blades that have that dive diving down yeah. blade same with the Malaysian. Yeah, it 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 really actually sets you up beautifully for a thrust. So, um yeah, I think I think the idea of having a guard is um I, I mean, why didn't they think of that before you? No, just kidding. Well, but, you know, I mean, the when you look at a kukri, a kukri is basically derived from a, from a Greek copus. And so if you look at my kukri, it, it's like, you know, if the, if the traditional kukri and the copus had a baby, that's kind of what mine looks like. 
Right. That copus had an almost fully encompassing hilt, right? It had that Cor big thing and the Correct. Correct. Yes. Oh, I love it. Okay, so uh, you said that when you were um, deployed, you carried around a uh, cold steel kukri. Yes. Um, so what was your impression? I I'm a, a cold steel fanboy, readily admit it. Uh, always have been since my first one in 1987 that I bought at the Randall Park Mall. Uh, I love cold steel. Um, what was that like having that knife in the field? Because my brother-in-law, a former Marine, uh, talks about how everything he had that was cool was stolen <laughs> when he was in the Marines. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, I, it, I like cold steel products. I have tons of cold steel products. I've, you know, I've done, I did a hog hunt in, uh, I don't even remember what year it was, maybe like 08, 07 or 08. And I had a, uh, cold steel tie pan that that my buddy had bought for me as a gift right and so i took that cold steel tie pan on a hog hunt and you know they have these little dogs called laces and they surround the hog and then you got to run in and stab them and uh the tie pan made such a devastating wound channel it was it was very disturbing and uh so i sent a picture to lynn thompson and you know they sent me like a i can't they sent me some like little scimitar type uh, knife as like a thank you and stuff and so cool. i've i love cold steel stuff i mean it's it's you know he's basically the the pioneer of you know making extremely good blades for an amazing price but also the diversity nobody in the yeah. knife industry has the diversity that he's done nobody Agreed. Agreed. And such a, an attention to history and beautiful, you know, modern interpretations of historical knives. His folding Navajas are my favorite, you know, among my favorites because I love those old knives and they're hard to find. Well, and he, you know, he he puts his blades where his mouth is. I mean, yeah. he doesn't just chop hanging meat. He goes out and hunts animals with all his products like. Right. You know. Right. How 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 much better could that get? So let's talk about how you kind of came into it. So you said you went uh, to an, a bladesmithing class, uh, blacksmithing and bladesmithing class, just kind of on a lark. Uh, you, right. So so t tell me about that and, and how that led to you deciding, uh, no, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. I, so I was like, OK, you know, like anything, like anything that I do, like with with firearms training, if somebody wants to buy a gun, you, you know, you should go get firearms training. And so. I, I wanted, I, I've just had that mindset of like, okay, well, if I'm going to make knives, I need to, th there's a million things I don't know. And there's a million things that I think I know that are probably wrong. So I wanted to go and get some, some sort of like formal classes on it. And I Googled, a, uh, I just kind of Googled like knife making classes in my area. I live in rural Texas there, you know, it's, it's about an hour and a half Northwest of Dallas. There's not a lot of stuff out. And I found this guy named Chuck Stone from Masters Forge. And I just emailed him and, and, uh, I was like, Hey, I, you know, I want to do some classes. And so he was like, well, come on out for a couple of days. So I did. And everything that I thought I was going to learn, I didn't. And everything that I learned, I liked better than what I thought I was going to learn. So like, for instance, he was very, very old school. And so everything was on a coal forge, which is a lot harder to, you know, to keep going and, and manipulate the steel and everything with that. And there was no, like, it was all hand hammer forged and you, you couldn't use like an angle grinder to cut a piece of steel off that you didn't want. You had to use a hot chisel. Right. So like everything was just like, I felt like I was like in the 1800s, like, you know, yeah. doing it for real. Well, uh, it's, uh, I'm know. sorry to, I, I want, it's like learning from, uh, you know, Michelangelo or something. You're not going to learn the new way. You're going to learn the old way and you're going to learn right. it right. And there's a million places to learn the new way, right? right? There's not a lot of places to learn the old way. And when I walked into Chuck's place, like this dude looked like a freaking blacksmith, like big old beard, you know, big old uh, gray beard, you know, kind of a burly, you know, soft spoken guy, super nice. And just like, and he picks up a hammer and, and puts a steel in there. It's just like the metal goes where he wants it to go. Like, it's just, it's fascinating. Uh, the strength someone builds up over years and years and years of doing that is uh, is amazing. And sometimes uh, you can see uh, the the um, lack of symmetry, you know, from one forearm right. to the other. Uh, yeah. 
but but all of that gripping and hammering uh so you uh forge you are a forger and also stock removal like you yes. do both right much okay. much more stock removal now than than hand hammering but you know i still do it so uh leaving okay so you're still we're still there at that blacksmithing class uh how did you know that this was something that you could do and make a go of uh and not just a passing fancy or something that you're uh, maybe not gifted with I, I really didn't. Um, I just, you know, I, I was kind of painted into a corner where it was like, I, I just kind of had to make this work. The, the one thing that I did have going for me was out here on the Richards Ranch, I had a guy, you know, the, the, the family were willing to, to let me take over their shop and have a forge. Okay. So for most people, the hardest part is like, where do you put your forge? So I had that covered. Um, I had a, a very good following of very loyal uh, past students from my firearms training company, you know, that supported me in the beginning of it, especially. And so I thought, okay, if I can just get this going, uh, I've got to make this work. And so I just, I just, lo I literally just locked myself in the forge. I didn't have to, a job to go to, anyways. And so I just took the steel. You know, Chuck told me where to go buy all the stuff at. And we have a really great uh, place down here called the Texas Ferrier Supply. And they have every knife making thing that you need all right there that you could touch and feel and see. And so I bought a coal forge. I bought a propane forge. I bought steel handles, grinder, you know, a little tiny crappy grinder. And just, just did trial and error for months and months. And then, and that was about December. And then march i believe march was when i like sold my first knife and was like okay i i feel like these are you know good enough to sell without you know too much reservation well uh you could easily see how your past experience having um a business uh, teaching firearms training uh could help you in the on the business side of opening a knife company i know i'm sure a lot of the a lot of things between service and retail are different but uh in essence there's a there's a uh a business sense that can translate so what what did you take from the marine corps into the creative part and the and the knife design part well like you know in, in the military kind of like what you what you covered on a little bit earlier was like you use a blade in the military for a million different reasons right whereas like in in the you know, the quote unquote civilian world, your likelihood of using your blade to defend yourself is very, very low. And so the, the whole knife fighting type stuff is not as applicable, but in the military, it's like, we go to schools, we go to silent century removal schools, we go to knife fighting schools. We have, when we do our close quarter battles, we have, you know, that type of training and stuff that that we get taught with so when we look at knives in the military it's like okay it's not a single use item i i really like to make my knives as multi-purpose as possible but because of the background of it i put the attention to that small percentage for for most of my clients and customers of actually using it to defend their life but if they have to it's going to do the job that is needed. Right. All right. Let's see. Let, let, let's look at some more of your knives. I want to get an idea okay. of, of what we're talking about. Um, we've seen the Kukri. Let's go, let's go from large to small. The other one I was mentioning before we started rolling, uh, that is my personal favorite on your website is your combat sacks or battle sacks. Yes. The, the sacks, um, unfortunately, we're only going to be able to do pictures if you pull it up online. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I can't, I don't, those just go so fast. That's a good problem to have. I don't, I don't have any uh, in stock, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a, 
it's a really well, nice knife. It's a big well, knife, though. You know, it's let's let's talk about long. it for a minute. Maybe Jim can uh, can find it on your on your website while we do. Uh, it's very interesting to me because it's it, it it was the classic combat utility knife in Western Europe for you know thousand a thousand years at least um, in various forms throughout Northern Europe and and Western Europe. And then, you know, it kind of disappeared. We, we as Americans love the Bowie and I love the Bowie. Uh, don't get right. me wrong. But so where did the sax go and, and what made you bring it back for combat purposes? So basically like, you know, Vikings used the sax. That was one of their raid blades that they would, they would use. And, and, you know, what, I, I give a lot of credit to Forge and Fire, Forge and Fire, the TV show doesn't always show you like it's not informative all the time as far as like this is how you make a knife this is how you do this but what i got out of forge and fire was the mistakes and how to diagnose the problems that they have that helps me make a better knife and the tests that they do on those blades and so if you watch forge and fire you'll see there's a ton of saxes that are on that show that get made and the uh the the advantage of the sax is it's multi-purpose right so it's an amazing chopping knife but it's also a great fighting knife if it was good enough for the vikings it should be good enough for anybody <laughs> these days right yeah uh i wanted to put a, you know if you look at my handle my handle's a, a smaller version of the of the kukri handle um you know you put a little bit of your style into it the the one thing that i changed on the sax today versus back in the day is that i put a a medium height grind at the tip so if you look at my sax my bevel does my main bevel edge does not go all the way across so if you look at the middle picture down at the tip you see that differential grind yeah. kind of about 3 inches from the tip and so what that does is that keeps the tip thicker because the higher you grind all the way across, the thinner your tip gets, right? And the tip is obviously an important characteristic of a knife. So a lot of my knives will have a differential grind uh, towards the tip that keeps it thicker and stronger, but it also creates a bigger initial wound channel. So I, I appreciate that because uh, not necessarily the wound channel part, but I would if I needed it for that. But I appreciate yeah. the extra beef up front, the extra steel up front, especially with a worn cliff. I'm, I'm very partial to that kind of uh, tip. But man, I've dropped almost all of them that I own on the tips just because, just yeah. because, and uh, with a little bit of extra uh, geometry up front, uh, it seems like the way to go. It makes everything about it harder. It's like I'm a glutton for punishment because if you think about like I make my own uh, kydex sheaths, right? So when I'm doing my kydex sheaths and I soften the kydex up and I fold it over, I have to go in and fill those grind areas because the tip is fatter than the mm, backside, yes. right? So yep. I have to make the backside as fat as the front. So I have to put all this extra material, cardboard spacers, things like that, and then tape it up. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to get your blade out yeah. uh, when you went to extract it, right? So it's a lot more work. So I I appreciate when people tell me that they appreciate that because it's a lot of extra work. That aspect. Well, also, it gives you, I mean, yeah, a lot of extra work. I'm thinking of the Kydex. I've made a few Kydex sheaths in my in my time and they're kind of a pain in the butt uh but yeah you gotta you gotta account for that extra little bit there right. uh like in a recurve the softens and hard and then hardens yeah and it'll lock it in there bigger now you won't be able to get it out uh but also on a on a swipe a slash uh, if you are heaven forbid using this thing as a weapon um uh, we all know uh, from Michael Janich, a Warncliffe style blade is amazing for a slash. It's an amazing right. tact tactical design. Uh, but you're, if you're swinging against someone who's armored with uh, layers of, you know, fabric and Kevlar or whatever it is, uh, magazines, right. and you don't want to be smashing that tip off on a, no. on a on an AK mag. No, no, AK mags are bad on bullets, let alone blades. <laughs> Uh, so, okay. Uh, actually, while Jim has this up, uh, I want to address that middle knife 
uh, that seems to be uh, the the one you're kind of your flagship knife right now. Um, talk about oh, that. Yeah, my DJ fighter. DJ uh, fighter. That's, yeah, that that is a. Tim, I, I love that profile. Uh, you know, I I have a small skull crusher on the bottom of it. Uh, I've got it's about I think it's about ten and a half inches overall length. Um, I like that it's a, a great stabbing knife, but you can also do, you know, slashes and stuff with it. And, and the thickness on all my fighters is three sixteenths of an inch. So they're not super thick, you know, over beefy blades. I, to, in my opinion, it, if your knife's 10 inches long and it's a quarter inches thick, it's just too much blade if you have a proper heat treat and good steel and, and everything three sixteenths is more than enough for a fighting knife. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so it makes it a, a great stabbing tool. You can cut with it. It's very aggressive looking. Um, I've got that one that you just saw. And then I just, I'm finishing up this one right now. Uh, mm -hmm. here's another DJ fighter. I haven't got it engraved yet. Um, and I'm still kind of cleaning it up and working it out, but here's a little better picture. I like, I like that thumb swale on the top. That's like, uh, you're really going to lock in there. Yeah. Yeah. I, everybody comments on it and, and it, they say it looks like you took a bite out of it because <laughs> of the, uh, well, the you know exactly line. what it's for. You know, exactly. Right. Your thumbs go in there for the Filipino grip. Can you, I'm sorry. Sure. Can you just hold that up again? There are yeah. a couple things I want to point out. Uh, something I really like in a, in a fighting style knife is something you see on um, traditional French fighting knives. Basically it, it has a wider blade at the Ricasso than the handle and right. the blade is the guard. And, um, and then incidentally it, it takes on that look of sort of a, uh, of a chef's knife. <laughs> I love, yes. I, I love it. I love the look of it. The Prather war buoy does that. Um, the, the uh, Fred Perrin, Knives do that. Um, there's something very appealing and utilitarian and simple about it. It also means you're looking at a full tang knife. Um, in your right. experience, uh, what what are the benefits of going full tang as opposed to uh, on a forged knife? You're frequently making something that is a stick tang that goes into a handle. Right. So the advantage of the full full tang blades is that you're you're going to get the overall strength of it. Uh, you can do more of what's called a differential heat treat. So when you harden a blade uh, in the oil all at once, it it inst it kind of goes from like fifteen hundred degrees to like seven hundred degrees in like a second, and it hardens all your carbon inside. Um, with full tangs, you can actually you can actually just quench like the blade or part of the blade. And it leaves your your full tang a little bit or your your tang a little bit softer. So if you're hitting stuff, you have vibration that's traveling through and has somewhere to go, versus just a super hard blade that's 100% uh, hardened. You have a better chance for breakage. The other thing is the balance. I don't, you know, with full tang blades, you don't have to counterbalance it with a brass pommel mm. or anything like that. So your balance is a lot more. It's, it's easily achieved uh, with a good balance on a full tang than with like a hidden tang where you have to compensate. Otherwise, that blade is just so blade heavy. I never, ever thought of that. And for a fighting knife, you want that balance kind of uh, right at the forefinger. You know, uh, I, I'm presuming that's what you're talking about. Yeah. And... I mean, I don't know exactly where where I'm at here, but let me just try to do this without killing myself here. But like, you know, I'm. Yeah right about you know right about at that spot right there yeah so, yeah yeah and and you're saying on a stick tang i never thought of this on a stick tang you do need the pommel you need the pommel to to screw onto the tang anyway but you know you do need that there for counterbalance right because you right. don't have all that i never thought of that that's interesting uh okay so we're looking at the dj fighter it looks like it has a number of different um this one has a sort of guard built into it Th those oh. are the older versions uh, okay. that I haven't that I just haven't updated. But yeah, the current version is what I just showed you uh, there. So it, it, I'm 
I, my website's pretty new and I'm in the process of putting a merchant account on it and getting everything updated. So it's just been, I mean, I just got a YouTube channel like a couple of days ago. So I'm like, nice. I'm really behind the fire curve on it. Well, I want to ask you, uh, uh, two things about your naming convention. First of all, um, since we're looking at the DJ fighter, uh, is or was DJ someone who was particularly um, fond of knives and that kind of training, knife fighting stuff? Um, yeah, it's named after my buddy Dana Jones. Uh, he, I wouldn't say that he was like into knife fighting or anything like that. He was, he's a very, very good friend of mine, and he was pivotal with my training company and getting it started and uh attending classes nonstop, bringing people out we've gone on hunts all over the midwest or excuse me all over the southwest uh just an awesome dude you know baja 500 racer just a stud and i wanted to name you know a a, a studly knife after him so that's cool i love that um and then sta blades what is what does that stand for um as far as the company goes it doesn't stand for anything uh, in the Marine Corps, snipers were in what was called a stay platoon, a surveillance target acquisition platoon. And my logo, that if you see on my logo, you can make out an S, a T, and an A. And that was our logo that we used uh, in the Marine Corps. So I had STA training group. And then so I started STA Blades. And I like it, you know, because, uh, you know, the acronym is is stab sta blades stab. Oh, yeah. so you know <laughs> yeah. i i thought it, i thought it was kind of cool uh and just kind of trying to carry a little bit of the of my background into the you know into the name and, and things like that so so for the how, company nothing how much of your background this the sniper uh community in um in the marine corps i know is is very tight and i know it's going through a serious upheaval if not a, a final upheaval for the moment anyway, uh, as things have restructured in the Marine Corps with the scout snipers. Right. But how, how much has that community, um, that sniper community, kind of helped you launch this uh, this company? Well, um, I, I, I think that, you know, I've gotten a lot of support from, from guys in the community, the, the reconnaissance community and the sniper community are very, very tight. And we worked together a lot. We went through a lot of the same training and deployments and things like that. And I had a lot of support from those guys. Um, and you know, and it's, it's hard because like I hate selling knives to my friends, right? It's the last person I want to sell a knife to because I feel obligated to give them a discount, right? Mm -hmm. I want to sell to the guy that I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The transaction's a transaction. He's not going to bring up what he used to do for me and what I owe him. Uh, but, you know, I always give the discounts to the snipers and the, and the reconnaissance Marines. Um, but, you know, and that's how Matt, Matt Chase and I uh, started communicating was Matt sent me uh, a, a message and, and, you know, he saw the name of my company and he's obviously, he put it together because he was, you know, from that same cloth and, you know, where it was awesome was I have never, up until March of this year at, at uh, blade show, Texas, Texas blade show, that was the first time I ever met Matt. So for like a whole year, I've been talking to this dude on the phone almost every day we talk and he's been so helpful with giving me ideas or just telling me, no, that's stupid. Don't do it. It won't work. I did it 30 years ago, you know, cause Matt's been making knives for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, he just got his journeyman Smith. Uh, and you know, so he's, he's, he's on a totally different level, right? He, he's my, he's my mentor, you know, so that that was nice to have a guy that I've never even met just be so willing to help me out with all this stuff and and uh just have a great friendship, you know. Yeah, he's uh he's a really really great guy. I'm I'm so happy my my dear old friend, my wife's best friend from high school, Drew Smith was uh the guy who introduced me to uh to Matt. Right. Chase. I I heard that on your podcast with Matt. Yeah. 
great great dude i mean you guys are all i don't know it, it's a it, it's a from the outside it seems like a, quite a brotherhood and uh, um I, yeah i, just I think mean it's... when you have 175,000 marines in the marine corps and you have about 200 of them that are snipers you know everybody kind of knows everybody or has heard of them or or whatever and so that that bond is is very very tight you know, because yeah, Matt was all West or East Coast sniper, and I was West Coast. I, we weren't even in the same units. It, it's the uh, and and then the idea of uh, your job, uh, the very nature of your job, making you a high value target and making you, um, you know, so, like one of the most sought after people on the battlefield. That's got a, that's that's uh, yeah, that's got a grind in the gut, man. That's a <laughs> that's a serious. So you meet other people who are who are you know who have the same. Um, experience and can relate on that level um uh, right that's, that's important um yeah it's pretty cool uh i want to talk a little bit about the stabbies and the and okay. the shivvies i okay yeah. so i'm a i'm a daily carrier here's a here's a, a knife that matt and i have collaborated on i'm a daily carrier of fixed blade knives i love them um i saw the stabbies especially the upswept one uh with yeah. the uh those things are really cool tell me about about these knives jim just had them up on screen so stabbies the stabby line so i have stabbies fighters shivs and skinners and then some chef knife stuff but for, as far as the stabbies go stabby just means that it's basically it's seven inches overall so it's kind of like an everyday carry size knife um the one you're talking about i believe is the mo which i don't have uh on me but I do have a couple of different uh, stabbies here, but the uh, the stabbies is just something that I wanted to make for for everyday carry. Um, you know, here is a FD stabby. This is a Sanmai uh, stabby. This one is named after a very good friend of mine, uh, Frank Vasoma, who who owned Patriot Ordnance Factory. And uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately, but this is his, his profile model. Um, and then I have an MD oh, stabby. Cool. Uh, and this, this is that grind that I was talking about on the sacks. Right. The, the kind of the differential grind that goes about halfway up. And, you know, you can see that the tip stays thicker with that. Cause if this grind went all the way up to that point, it would be this thin up here right so, you know so yeah this this the old stabbies that that's you know that's definitely been a huge part of my of my line and, and everything and then the shivvies and the shivvies the shivvies were kind of they came from the oss soe daggers uh from from world war ii basically where like they they'd have them strapped to the wrist and it, it didn't have a cutting edge it was just a stabbing instrument and it was basically made to be able to stab through you know in civilian clothes the oss would would you know jump into france or whatever and they'd you know they could stab a, a german soldier through his leather jacket and do a combat recovery of his guns and gear and kind of outfit the resistance and everything like that and so i wanted to make something that uh could sleeve into a molly so just as you can see it just goes into a vertical molly loop it the sheath sleeves down and then you tie with the 550 cord at the bottom and anchor it and so the shiv is oh, cool. it's basically just got uh about two inches of cutting edge right and there's a little oil and finger just enough to get you in the door well, and, and this is the thing, like in the military, if I'm in a Humvee and it's chow time uh, and I need to open up my MRE, uh, you know, to reach for my K bar to pull it out is is hard. But if it's here on my on my LBV or my plate carrier, I've got something that will will open it. But because it's so thin, I don't have a guard. So if I stab and I hit bone and my mm. fingers slide up, I'm not cutting my my fingers on it. And it's generally made for stabbing, but I've also got the ability to to do cutting. 
Yeah, I love that. It also, um, the way you pulled it out in reverse grip with the thumb on the back, you know, that that's probably how you're going to use that knife. Um, Absolutely. 100% you're be doing of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unless you're and, opening your MRE and then you don't have to right. really worry about it. I love that. So are they all that uh, American Tanto? Um, um, for the for the most part, I do do uh, I do a, a a version that's similar to the DJ fighter. That's kind of your traditional, you know, mm. round belly type up into almost like a, a, a Japanese Tanto. Right. Uh, okay. So, you know, I you know, the. The other shiv that I do, I just kind of came out with this one. Uh, this is called the die bar. Uh, everybody's making pry bars nowadays, and the, the pry bars bar. are the pry bars are cool. But I wanted to make a die bar because, like everything else I make, I wanted it to be multi-purpose, right? So I have I do a, a differential tapered grind oh, on the yeah. back here, right? What's Oops. the purpose of that? So basically what I'm doing is I'm keeping this part thin because it's nice and strong. And, you know, as you taper up front here, if I make this grind real thin, oh, okay. my, my crowbar end is not going to be very strong. Right. So once again, you know, I'm a glutton for punishment. I like to do things the hard way. Um, but basically you've got your, your crowbar pry bar. You can actually use it as a glass break. Uh, there is no cutting edge on this blade. Okay, so it's only for stabbing if you had to defend yourself. But if you look at the tip, you know, it's a pretty it's a pretty mean tip. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It reminds me a little bit of a Besh wedge up there. Do you know what that is? No. In the 80s, there was a, a knife maker. I can't remember his first name, but but he made these tips and uh, a couple of different companies used them and they were wedge like tips. You look it up uh people if you're listening okay. the besh the besh wedge I, I don't want to try and describe it i could probably draw it uh but it was a thing at one point and it was to make the tip real uh real stout i don't think it really caught on in a huge way um but the way you have it it it's actually got a point the other one was more of a wedge tip and right. this actually has a point you could br breach anything with that right and you can you can stab it and use it as a defensive uh weapon as well i put a reference line here just so that when guys and girls are grabbing they they're not uh grabbing back here and then prying because then the tip would go through your hand and it wouldn't mm. feel very good um you can also use this as a punch spike right so if i just oh, yeah. punch like that that's you don't want you don't want that um and I uh, just wanted something that was universal, but you know, everybody's into the pry bar stuff. And it's like, well, why just carry a pry bar if I can have something that could actually defend my life with, you know, as well, you know? Yeah. Again, uh, sort of fitting into that philosophy of uh, uh, ounces are pounds and pounds are pain. And if you're yeah. out there carrying all of that stuff, um, you know, you could bring a dagger and a pry bar, or you could just bring a pry bar that can do the daggers work. Right. Um, um yeah. also, yeah, I think you're right. There is a big trend towards tactical screwdrivers and tactical yeah. pry bars and all that. Um, it is I I find those things interesting, um, but just about only interesting, only because my suburban dad lifestyle doesn't require uh the pry bar. Now, uh, yeah. a a die bar, maybe because uh, you know, there are carjackings around here. Uh right, yeah. And the but dive bar, the, the name gets you gets a little attention too, you know. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, with, with military and law enforcement, they're you know for the guy that's wearing a plate carrier every day, it's a great tool to have. You know, and I I do them in titanium, uh, you know, to make them a lot lighter, grade five titanium, mm -hmm. uh, stainless and, and high carbon. So there's a couple of different uh, versions of it. So that is a that is one real benefit when you're going into making knives for combat. Obviously, you've been there, and so you know the kind of things that you need and the kind of things that are not. That's why I was very surprised when you said that uh, during some of your deployment you had a uh, cold steel kukri because that is a big and heavy. That is, you know, a uh, ten inch blade that's a quarter inch thick. But obviously, you're not bringing it out there because you think it's cool. You had some real right. use for it, and and it's and it's 
dependent on the situation. If I'm doing a black side mission, like a, a urban environment mission, I'm not taking. If I'm doing a green side, you know, in thick vegetation and stuff like that, yeah, I'm I'm gonna bring it. And if I need it, great. If I don't, you know, yeah, whatever. But uh, some things are just worth having because when you, when you're operating in a four man team, you know, you, you, everything has to be multi purpose. You know, you can't just it, you have to have the ability to to use it in just you know more than one different type of thing you know we we could use the kukris for fighting and defending our lives and we could use them for clearing brush you know cutting wood whatever kind of weird stuff you get you know thrown at you yeah because out there you're doing i mean you need to be stealthy and you need to carry a lot of heavy stuff and you need to be stealthy <laughs> and you're still yeah. you carry tons of heavy. Uh, I can't even imagine. I don't know what the job entails, but I do know that it's uh, those two things play a role. And uh, so to have tools made by someone like you who knows and who's been out there, I think is a real bonus. The um, like I, you, you said it was green side that I guess that means a mission out in the field. And then black right. side is something in an urban environment. Right. It, it seems like your die bar is uh, like exactly made for that urban environment sort of um, mission. Definitely. It, it looks Definitely. like you could turn it around, use that bird's beak to the pry bar to to smash through brick walls or, you know, smash through things. You said glass, yeah. but w windows, everything. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I, I mean, that's that's also the spirit. uh uh, through which the tomahawks have kind of been re reintroduced to com modern combat. I love that. Right. You know, it, it it activates my imagination for sure. But I also just love the fact that some things don't don't go out of style. I think this is why why people love why modern warriors love makers like uh, Winkler, for instance, who who right. does stuff that looks like it's from the Revolutionary War because it is because that's how he started making making uh, repros for his. Right. Uh, reenactments and stuff absolutely you seem, you seem to have lost your camera there jared just stand by for one second i'm just trying to get this cord plugged in sorry sure thing and while you do i'll i'll blather on about Thank tomahawks so like uh so to me that's like a traditional tool that you think oh you know with guns and atomic weapons and cruise missiles what do we need tomahawks for uh i guess that's a little bit of a pun there with the cruise missile but um right in fact is it doesn't go out of style, you know, a sharp blade and a pry bar at the end of a haft that you can use for both a tool and a weapon that doesn't go out of. No, I mean, tomahawks are awesome for breaching doors and bad guys. I mean, they're, they're multi-purpose. So. So what are the, what are the, uh, what are the kind of things you want to make in the future? What are the kind of knives you'd like to take on? I, I definitely want to do, you know, I definitely want to do tomahawks. I want to do short swords, uh, but you know, I'm a one man shop. I do all my stuff in house. Uh, I do all my heat treat. I do, you know, pretty much like, just like Matt does. And, you know, so I, I don't have the means to, to play around a lot with stuff that I'm interested in uh, until I get the business, you know, up and kind of run, you know, running on its own with orders and stuff like that. And so, you know, the, and it's all seasonal too. Right. So like, hunting season when hunting season comes the skinners uh get really popular and you know my my skinners um here's one of my skinners here uh this Ooh. is called this this is called the cj okay and That's if beautiful. you see i put a swooping guard here so when you're inside the animal gutting it out you have a reference and almost a lock to where your finger is and it also will kind of protect you from like broken ribs and shards that that are in when oh, you're that is when cool. you're cutting and then what i did was you can take you can take it so like low light elk hunting you know you shoot an elk at at sun you know sunset and uh what i did was i i also put cat eyes in there oh, so you can cool. so you can illuminate the cat eyes and sit it on the ground and and still know where it goes um and i i do the same with my this is my new general purpose knife that i'm doing for a company called free wind defense uh which is here in texas they wanted a nine and a quarter inch overall general purpose knife 
and I did the cat eyes. Uh, I did the cat eyes on it as well for them. And uh, this is a cool. What, so, wait, uh, what's this company? And 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 tell me a little bit about this knife. Uh, so this is called the Free Wind Defense General Purpose Knife. And Free Wind Defense is a company owned uh, by my buddy Dave Staffel, who is a former uh, Special Forces officer and uh just an amazing dude and he's basically they do bushcraft classes they do survival classes um and then they they offer kind of some of the most applicable stuff that you know equipment that you can get um he wanted me to make a knife that was perfect for having out in the field that you could still skin with so what i did was i rounded i rounded the the top spine of the tip to make it stronger uh -huh. I left this right angle so you can still hit it with a ferro rod uh, to start fires. And then I, I put an angle down right here from the flat portion of the spine. And that's basically like an aiming reference. Uh, same with the, the scalloping here. That, that's like an aiming reference for if you're like putting this on a log and whacking it with another log to split wood. Mm -hmm. You have kind of an aiming reference there. And then you have the cat eyes and then the mini skull crusher uh, on the bottom and just kind of make it an all around, not too big, not too small uh, yep. fighting knife, differential blended differential grinds. So as you notice, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of contrast on the grinds compared to like this one. Right. See how it blends in up here and it's yeah. just for strength and, and stuff. Uh, I like the way the swedge or the the, the little tip is crowned. Uh, it, it it's a way to keep it thick up there. It's also a way to save your baton if you are batoning wood. Um, yeah. But thirdly, it's a great way to make it slip into organic mediums better. You know, like absolutely, it's, it's doing the swedge job, uh, but but kind of uh, with a little bit more finesse because you're using it for a multi-purpose tool. Right. And anything rounded is going to be stronger than anything that has right angles. Right. Um, yes, so yes. it just gives it a little going back to that strong tip, you know, that's, that's kind of my thing, I guess. Right. I well, like, I, I don't like breaking my tips out in the field, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure this is all coming from experience. So how, how, how can people uh, research your work, get in touch with you, um, and and get your get your knives? It it sounds like there are a lot of people out there who could use them. These are tough uh, field ready utility weapons or weapon utility knives. Right. Yeah. the The website stablades.com has all my email, uh, phone number, everything on there. I am setting up the merchant account to be able to put up knives that are you know in stock and ready to go. Otherwise, I kind of I, I'm real big. I have a bigger footprint on Facebook, um, but, you know, Instagram as well, uh, all under STA Blades, TikTok and YouTube and all that. Uh, but if they contact me, um, you know, and, and kind of just let me know what profile they like uh, or if they have questions that, you know, uh, want to have a specific handle color or texture or something like that, you know, we can we can definitely do that. I, for one, reached out to you on Instagram and you responded yes. very quickly. So uh, that, that's a good Instagram is magic, man. It, it for for knife makers in particular, because you can go and you can look and you can drool and you can really uh, become attached to knives, you know, and and find new makers that way. Uh, before yeah. I let, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say I, it for me, I I probably sell nine knives to on Facebook to every one I do on Instagram. It's oh, I love Instagram, oh. but I just don't have the buyers on Instagram. Uh, you know, so it's it's always different for everybody, but you know, it's okay. gr it's growing. I'm new, so. Yeah, so it does, so Facebook might be the place. Uh, uh, but uh, I was going to say before I let you go, I don't want to let you off the hook. I want you to tell me what your fantasy build is. What what is that uh, you know, a, a knuckle duster knife like that or something like what is your fantasy build you, that you can't do right now because you just don't have the chops right um i i really would like to do a greek copus that's always been kind of the the one that i that i've wanted to do i would also it's that or like a um uh, like a full-size like 
you know, gladius, oh, uh, yes. you know, type, type of sword, the knuckle dusters, uh, you know, I could never, I can't make the actual knuckle duster, but, uh, when I went to my bladesmithing class, Chuck Stone, he gave me the knuckle duster handle for that, for one of those oh, knives, like an, a legit one, but it didn't have the knife in it. So he said, here, here's a present for you. Uh, one day finish this knife up and have fun with it. So that is so I'm, cool. I'm going to, I'm going to do that one day. The one, have you seen the ones that Matt does? They're insane. Yeah. The, he did. what? Those are part of a collaboration with Les George. Another, yes. another Murray. Yes, exactly. Um, the, and the ones that Matt made are stunning. Uh, those. Yeah. Uh, he does the, the sta stainless sand mine. Yeah, stainless sand mine. That's what it is. Yeah. With the part of it is black, part of it is silver. Yeah. And then exactly yeah, gorgeous, man. Uh yeah, I was just saying knuckle duster because it seems hard, but uh, I love the idea of of making uh knives or or um swords from the ancient world that we're still using today, like you did with the kukri, but just their ancient form. Um I I'll be here for it, man. I can't wait to see them. Okay. Uh, Jared, I'll, I'll, thank you so much yeah. for coming on and talking my about pleasure. SDA blades, man. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. And to patrons, we're going to continue this conversation. So uh, be sure to check us out there. All right. Thank you, Jared. Take care, sir. Thank you. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Jared Johnson of STA Blades, uh, making unapologetic utility weapons for the field uh, and EDC. I love those, uh, the EDC, uh, the stabbies. Those are pretty sweet, too. So be sure to check them out. Uh, Facebook seems to be the best place, uh, but also Instagram. I do know uh, some beautiful shots there, and you can reach out to Jared there. All right. Uh, be sure to check us out next week for another great conversation. Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental, and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.